what holds your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind. The cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Seek and you will find. Joy, Joy still, still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing, praise the Lord. The years roll by. We wonder why. Lost our way from home. Our Father finds the child inside. We left for growing old. Awake, 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 past soul. Joy still comes in the morning. Still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing, praise the Lord. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise. Then praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Hey, good morning. Good to see you all. These are my friends Natasha and Amanda. They are here from the Family Life Center uh, over in Newton. If you remember, uh, just a handful of months ago, we did that baby bottle drive. You remember that? From Mother's Day to Father's Day. And uh, that was to collect spare chain and different financial gifts to help fund uh, their ministry and, and what they're doing over there in that area. And so they're going to just share briefly, uh, but they had told us that our church raised $201 through that baby bottle drive. So that is fantastic. And uh, uh, totally, overall, their total fundraiser for the baby bottle drive was eighty-seven grand. So uh, just, uh, yeah, just give God praise for that. 
That's uh, super great. So I'm going to hand it off to you guys, and then I'll have a closing time after you're done. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name's Natasha Buchanan, and I'm um, from Greenup, and I'm the nurse at the Family Life Center in Newton. I just want to thank you guys so much for letting us come and speak at your church today and um, for doing the baby bottle project. That's such a big, big help for us. Um, I just didn't know if you knew what the Family Life Center is, so I'm just going to talk real quickly about the services that we provide. Um, we're a faith-based um, pro-life Christian organization. Uh, we're a pregnancy resource center. So what we do is we come alongside um, mothers and fathers in unplanned pregnancies and unplanned pregnancy situations. Um, we do free pregnancy testing. Everything that we provide is free. Um, because of donations and generous support. Um, we do pregnancy testing, we do um, ultrasounds. I am getting trained to do ultrasounds, so we'll hopefully be bringing <coughs> ultrasound to Newton by the first of the year, next year, hopefully, uh, maybe before that. But then we also do um, education. We do fetal education and development, pr prenatal education, um, parenting, adoption, relationship training, and then we also provide post-abortion support for moms who have been through an abortion. Um, we have several free programs, prenatal education, parenting, moms, dads, and then breastfeeding. And then one of the things that we're really proud of is we do baby showers with the moms. And if they come and come through our educational programs, we give them material things um, like diapers, wipes, clothes, and a big giant baby basket full of things that they would need for their baby. And then a free car seat. And they just do that just by coming to educational um, places for us to do and just baby showers or one-on-one -on -one education. Um, so we are able to do that just because of donors and just <coughs> just because of God. We're just doing God's ministry throughout by helping these moms and dads when they're not sh not sure they want to be pregnant, not sure if they know what to do, and just helping them along. And I'm going to let you talk to Amanda. Thanks. My name's Amanda Leslie, and I had the privilege of serving as a volunteer and um, steering committee mem member for the Newton Project. Um, my husband and I and our two daughters live in Newton, and I have been involved in Pregnancy Center um, for many years, but just so excited that um, the services in Effingham are now in um, our area and serving Jasper and Richland counties. And so in addition to the Family Life Center, we also recently opened the Silk Purse, which is a um, thrift shop, resale store, and so all of the proceeds from that go to help support operations for the Family Life Center. Our goal is eventually that that will provide 35 to 50 percent of the operating income needed to keep the center open, but that takes a while. We just, um, right after Labor Day, started opening up for shopping. Um, in the month of August, we started receiving donations, so if you are cleaning out closets, if you're thinking of fall, please, anything. Um, you know, we would love to accept. Um, and so, but over the next year, we recognize that while the Silk Purse is growing and expanding and, and really getting settled, that we will need more operating support. So things like the Baby Bottle Campaign, we also have our annual fundraising banquet coming up, um, and that is the September 29th in Effingham. And there are still seats available. It's an amazing night where you get to hear client testimonies. You'll hear from Mary Hovis, our executive director. We have a wonderful speaker lined up. Um, and so it's just a great night. Grab another couple. Um, and it is free to attend, but there will be a financial appeal. It's a fundraiser. So that's September 29th at the Thelma Keller Convention Center. Call the office in Newton or Effingham, and we'll be happy to get you a RSVP for that. And then in addition, um, we are just looking for churches and individuals that will walk alongside us with monthly support. Um, we have a little bit left on our capital campaign that allowed us to get both of those facilities and renovated. So um, there are still financial needs, but God is so abundantly provided. Um, I mean, a year ago, this was just a vision, and here we are. And I know um, Natasha can share, we've already, we're already serving clients. We've had an abortion-minded client that had came to Effingham and really, you know, she verbally was planning an abortion, and then Natasha and the staff did several follow-ups, and we hadn't heard from her, and then I think it was just a couple weeks ago, she showed up at a baby shower education class in Newton, and she is parenting her baby, so... 
we just thank you. Um, this ministry being open um, to be the hands and feet of Christ and, you know, just walk along and support um, young families and men and women that are just struggling with, uh, you know, the unplanned pregnancy or even just how to parent um, and overwhelm. So thank you for helping make that possible. Yeah, if you will, give them a round of applause. Thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. They're going to be, uh, Natasha and Amanda are going to be sitting right here behind Jim uh, on the, in the front or the second to front row on the side. So I wanted to give you guys a chance to ask any follow-up questions at the end of service. If you would like to individually partner uh, and, and be a, a supporter of the ministry there uh, at the Family Life Center, uh, I encourage you to do that. So get with them with any questions or maybe you would say, man, I'd like to serve in some way. So I'm sure they can answer all those questions at the end of service. So if you girls would just stay at the front here in the corner, that way anyone that would like to talk to them after service is over, please feel free to do that. Let's pray over their ministry, and we'll continue in song uh, this morning. Dear Lord, uh, man, we're just so grateful uh, for, for this conviction you've laid on all these people's hearts in the Newton area to start this for Jasper and Richland County. Um, man, Lord, you know, it was just our spare change, uh, everyone's spare change, and there's $87,000 uh, to your glory, uh, because, uh, namely because of what you did through that. And so, Lord, I just... I thank you for the testimony of the mom who decided to keep her child and had a baby shower recently. Man, I just pray you meet her every need and, and continue to provide for her in, in ways she could never imagine. Uh, Lord, help us uh, continue to just uh, really be understanding of where people come from in life. Sometimes it's tempting to view people that have had abortions negatively, critically. Uh, let us be compassionate to the people that we know that have had abortions, let us be willing to engage and talk to people that are maybe scared or nervous or don't know what to do. Help us to just be what the girl said, be Jesus's hands and feet uh, to people. And practically, let us not just focus on getting the baby out of the womb, but let us be pro-life in those first six months. Let us be willing to watch kids. Let us be willing to buy diapers. Let us be willing to do the practical things that helps sustain life from womb to tomb. God, I just pray that you meet their every need, that you do a great work at their fundraiser dinner. And Lord, I just pray in this time that we can now shift our attention to just get lost in our worship of Jesus and what he's done for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Think about our wonderful God. The universe declares his majesty. All creation cries his glory. Amen. Let's Amen. sing that. Lord of all creation, what are earth and sky? Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. Your majesty, you 
goes beyond the galaxy. You are holy, holy. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy. Guitar's dead. <laughs> you want to run some batteries up here as we I can get ready for the next I can hear, I can hear. Oh, you can hear it. Is it dead out there, John? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks. While we're waiting, if you are a visitor or haven't been here for a while, make sure that you fill out one of those cards in front of you and put it in the offering box in the back there. So, or in, when you go out, whatever, but make sure you do that. like it's out there that's good all right god you reign <laughs>
Timothy 4 8 it says there is a crown the crown of righteousness given to every individual who yearns for the glorious appearing of our Lord and oh Lord we yearn for your appearing even so Lord Jesus come amen amen, amen.
Good morning. Oh, so, man, that's loud. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, okay. I don't know how many of you in this room know how hard it is to find a home right now, but man, it is really hard. The housing market is crazy right now, and uh, Eric and I have been searching for homes for the past uh, month or so, uh, and there's been no luck so far. And just this last week, Eric and I stumbled across this, this home, right? that we felt like was, was perfect. This was, this was going to be the home. It had a really nice backyard for, for youth events that we could do in the future. Uh, it was literally right down the street from the uh, junior high. So, man, just great outreach that would have been. Um, it was fully remodeled, had a fully remodeled kitchen, um, had a living room, bathroom that was fully remodeled. Uh, man, it, and it was a really good deal, too. We thought that this was going to be the home. We thought that everything was pointing toward us getting this home. It was great. And on Tuesday of this last week, we put an offer on the home and uh, hoping that we would get it. And we were to hear news back on Wednesday if they had accepted the offer or not. Um, we prayed all throughout the process, Lord, if this is your will, um, if this is the home that we can glorify you in, um, that, then we know that you will provide for us. But even if you don't, we will still serve you. And long story short, we uh, didn't end up getting the home. I got the call Wednesday after church. And uh, we were sad, of course, that we didn't get the home. But in the midst of our sadness, we were reminded, I was reminded um, of this verse from James 1, verses 2 through 3. It says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. See, I love this word, joy. Sometimes when, we, when people think of the word joy, we, we think it in, in terms of an emotion, right? Okay, it means that I'm happy. But no, um, this kind of joy in the Bible is not an emotion, rather it is a choice. This kind of joy says that despite my circumstances, I'm going to choose, to choose joy knowing that it is the testing of my faith in Christ. And what is that testing that James says that is the testing of your faith when you choose joy? Well, to put it simply, it is, is Christ enough? Is Christ enough in our lives? See, whenever we face hard things in our life, that uh, don't go our way, we need to ask ourselves this question. Is Christ enough? Is the payment for your sins enough? Is the, is the God who formed you and knows every hair on your head enough? Is the God of the universe who created you and loves you enough? See, all we need truly is Jesus it's no wonder that Jesus says this in John 6, 53 through 54, after he had just done the feeding of the 5,000. He says this, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus literally says, you need to consume me. I need, to be, I need to be the one that satisfies you. Nothing else can satisfy you like me. And as we take communion today, I want us to prepare, and as we prepare for the sermon, may we set our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Remember that today, that Jesus alone satisfies us. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for today. I pray as we just take communion today that we would just really think about this, that, that you alone satisfy us, that you give us everything we need, that no matter the circumstances, no matter the hard things going on in our lives, that we can choose joy. Choose joy because we know that you saved us from our sins. 
Lord, we praise you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, if you're new with us, we got children's church going on. So kids, you are dismissed. That's for any ages from two years old to fifth grade, two different Bible classes during the sermon time. So if you're heading to that, go ahead and head on back. And if you're staying in here, go ahead and open up to Judges chapter 14. That's where we're going to be this morning as we continue our sermon series about risky business, and we've been looking at good kinds of risk and bad kinds of risk and all kinds of different kinds of risk, and today we look at foolish risk. Now, we looked at the rich fool last week under the umbrella of unnecessary risk and unnecessary things that he risked throughout his life that, that, that ended up paying off for nothing and what he thought would pay off forever. Now, we turn our attention to a guy that maybe comes to some of our minds as a guy that took a lot of foolish risks, did a lot of foolish things. Sometimes we don't always, that's not always the first thing we think of when we think of the character of Samson. Uh, when you think of Samson, you think what? Strong, Fabio, he had my kind of hair, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, we, we think these things of Samson. And those are the, maybe Delilah comes to your mind, right? We know of his girlfriend later on in chapter 16, Delilah, long hair, and super macho strength are kind of the first three things that you probably think of if you were to play a word affiliation game and the word was Samson. But really, the I think the non-Sunday school story that we don't get about Samson is he messed up a lot. He took a lot of foolish risks. He did a lot of foolish things. And we're going to look into his life today, and really my hope is that you don't just see Samson, but you see yourself, and you see how can I avoid foolish risks going forward. So let's get into this together. Judges chapter 14, let's read the first nine verses. It says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, if there is not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. 
His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines at that time. The Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnon. They came to the vineyards of Timnon. Behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Verse 6, then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. Uh, I don't know people that tear young goats, but okay. <laughs> but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. Verse 8, after some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Now, now you probably... <laughs> A lot of moving pieces here. Some of it, you know, the young goat I joked about, like, what is that about? But what's going on here? Why record this story about Samson having this encounter with the lion? Maybe that's cool, but why all the narrative about him going back, there being little Debbie honey buns inside, you know, collecting those, giving them to his parents, but keeping it a secret of where he got it from. Samson, as you read in the chapter before in Judges 13, is going to be under this Nazarite vow for life. And Nazarite vows found number six, and, and uh, it includes several things to do. And a Nazarite vow would be taken on temporarily, not permanently, but for Samson, it was to be permanent his whole life. And one of those things was to not ever touch a dead body. And, and so what does he do here in the text? He touches, he breaks that Nazarite vow that was supposed to be lifelong to God. So maybe at that surface, it seems harmless for us to say, oh, what's, what's the harm in getting some honey out for him and his parents? And, and doing that. But there's a reason in verse 9 he keeps it a secret. Why? Because it's sinful. That's why we keep secrets uh, for, from people, from God. Is, is we, or at least one reason is, is sometimes it's because the thing we did is sinful. Um, Bob Engel, uh, he said this a long time ago. I've always remembered this about the honey and the lion story with Samson. He said, Satan will always put something sweet in something despicable. And so that's really the first observation worth noting today is that fools always fall for something sweet and something sinful. And isn't that the truth? I mean, sin is tempting because it's sweet, because it's like honey, because it's fun, because it's exhilarating, because it feeds our flesh. This is why we sin. I mean, take note of all the language about Samson and his soon-to-be wife, his fiance, this this woman he has spotted. We don't read. He he don't even know her. We don't even know her name, <laughs> let alone about anything about her personality or her spirituality or her quirks or different things about her. And Samson just robotically says, "She looks good, so that's who I want to marry." You know, it's just this classic dumb guy. You know storyline and it's it's you can already see the story going awry because samson who is supposed to be this liberator this champion of israel to liberate them from philistine oppression and bondage is just getting in bed with the enemy and getting ready to marry the enemy. that's why his parents in verse three they say is there any there's not a woman in all israel that you're going to marry, you're going to marry this person who's of the uncircumcised Philistines. See, with Samson, there was no logic. It was just, I got to I gotta get immediate gratification. I refuse to delay it. Samson was governed by what was right in his eyes. Look what he says there in verse 3. Get her for me, for she's right in my eyes. See that again in verse 7, I believe. Then he went down and talked with the woman. She was right in Samson's eyes. If you flip a couple pages forward in your Bible to the last verse of the book of Judges, in Judges 21, 25, it really sums up the whole time frame in Israel. In, in, it, in that, it says in Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was what? Right in their own eyes. So not just Samson, it's everybody. And this is what the world preaches to us today, Right? Is that, hey, what, what's good for you is good for you. And what's good for you is good for you. And what's good for you is good for you. And what's good for you is good for you. That everything is subjective. Nothing is objective. Everything's relative. And you should do whatever makes you happy. 
Well, guess what? There's crazy people in the world, and if they did what makes them happy, that would not be good. So we got to think of what we're believing, what we're preaching, what we're sharing with people. Nothing persuades Samson. His mind is made up. The only thing that matters to him is his own satisfaction. It says this in Proverbs 10, 23. Doing wrong is fun for a fool, but living wisely brings pleasure to the sensible. I had my youth minister in high school. I'll never forget this. This lesson he did, he opened up the line with, is sin fun? And we're, what do you think we said? Oh, no, 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 He's like, well, then why do you do it? Because being a fool is fun. Uh, it's exhilarating. It's exciting. It's, it's what we want to do. It's what we're inclined to do. It's our, I suppose it's our default position of our heart is to be bent towards foolishness and, and seeking whatever, whatever gives us pleasure. So think about the things that's happening here in what we've read. And later on, in, in, for the rest of the chapter, Samson's going to have this marriage feast. We're going to read it about it in a second. And he's going to end up making a joke about the, the honey situation and, and keeping that a secret. So think about, what, what, about this, this principle. I want to come back to it. Something sweet and something sinful. Think about what's happening here. Is being married a good thing? Is Samson marrying... One woman in a monogamous marriage, is that a good thing? Yeah, that, 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 that can be a good thing. That can be something that's not sinful, but, but he's, the, the, the reason for the marriage is lust. It's nothing else, and that's certainly sinful. Is it good for him to marry this one woman? Yeah, that's good. That's not a bad thing, but, but she's a Philistine. She's going to lead his heart away from the God of Israel because of her culture and her customs and her different things. And so there's... Something sinful and something sweet. It says they're walking down towards the vineyards. Another part of, of the Nazarite vow is not ever touch wine throughout the Nazarite vow. So what is Samson doing by a vineyard? What, what, why are you? So him having freedom is not a bad thing. But him using that freedom to walk into a vineyard is certainly sinful for him. He's at this marriage feast later on in chapter 14. Uh, being at a marriage feast, nothing, nothing, that's pretty harmless in and of itself. But then he's making jokes and having this pridefulness come out of his riddle that he pitches to these 30 guys. At, and then providing for his parents a meal. Here's some honey for you. Got, got some good dessert for us. In and of itself, not bad. Good thing to provide for your parents. But how he got that provision certainly was sinful. So you just see this pattern. This is how... Satan works with us. This is the temptation of sin all the time is that it's, it, you might say, well, I'm, I'm never going to ever even come across a torn apart lion's carcass. And that's not the point. The point is that this is how Satan operates in our world today. Is he, he, he gets us tunnel visioned and focused on the honey inside a dead body. You see what's happening here? He's all this sin, all this evil, all this darkness is all around it. But but he puts a golden nugget right there to, to say, well, yeah, all the all this other stuff is gross and bad and terrible on the outside. But but man, this this one thing that would that would that would be really good on your palate, wouldn't it? And so don't be confused. Satan still operates the same way today as he did in Samson's day, as he did in the Garden of Eden, as he will forever until Jesus comes back. Satan is always going to take sweet things and dress them up. It's going to be cloaked in sweetness, but the, the substance is going to be sinful. Satan always puts something sweet and something sinful, and fools always fall for the sweet thing and something sinful. Let's keep reading verses 10 through 20 of chapter 14. It says, His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. As soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I'll give you 30 linen garments, 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. They said to him, put your riddle that we may hear. Challenge accepted. Verse 14, and he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, 
Entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? That escalated quickly. And Samson's wife wept over him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have put your riddle to my people, and you have not told me what it is. He said to her, Behold, I haven't told my father nor my mother. Shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, Hey, Samson, what is sweeter than honey? And what's stronger than a lion? He said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, wow, you would not have found out my riddle. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and went down. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town and took their spoil and gave their garments to those who told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. Goes without saying, don't call your wife that word in verse 18 that Samson called her. Just sidebar, sneaking it in there. That is probably one reason why we get to verse 20, where <laughs> his, the, the wife's dad concludes, uh, I think Samson is done with, with my daughter. Here's a second observation that I see as Samson is this fool that we continue to see take foolish risks, and something else that fools do is not only just fall for something sweet and something sinful, but I think fools do this, is that fools make jokes about sin instead of war against sin. See, what he, he, he knows in verse 9 what he's doing is sinful and bad. That's why he keeps it a secret. So you might say, well, maybe he didn't know. Maybe he didn't know he was breaking the Nazarite vow. Maybe he didn't know he wasn't keeping God's commands. No, no, no. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he's making a conscious decision, a premeditated decision, to live in sin instead of war against it. And this is what fools always do, is they would rather stay contented in sin instead of actively fight in war against it. So he makes a riddle about his sin experience. Literally, in verse 14. And we see how that plays out. Samson is just very spiritually calloused at this point. His whole mission is to be going to war against the Philistines, and he just having a marriage and marrying a Philistine woman, an enemy, and, and hanging out with 30 Philistine dudes and losing a bet and being super mad, hot in anger. Says he comes back in 15-1. See this with me? After some days at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with the young goat, and he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. That's the only reason he's going back is to sleep with her, to save face. And then in 16.1, Samson went to Gaza. There he saw a prostitute, went into her. He, he just, and then 16.4, he meets Delilah, falls in love with her. You just see this ongoing pattern with Samson. If you ask Samson in these moments in chapters 14 through 16, do you love the God of Israel? Yes, I do. Oh, do I do. He's declared me to be the judge of Israel. But nothing in Samson's life would give an indication that he loves God, right? They're not a lick or evidence tangibly of what, how he used his time, how he used his life in Judges 14 to 16 for the kingdom of God's benefit. It says this in Titus. 116. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Have you been there before as the fool? Foolishly saying, I love God. I love God. I'm about God. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I go to church. I I I, I do these things. But but there's not a shred of evidence or anything tangible in your life. That, that just like Samson would suggest, really? You, you, you talk this way and you walk this way? You, you, you do that? See, the world encourages us to gratify every inclination of our heart. Samson has fallen into this trap. He should have been at war and he's cracking jokes at a wedding feast. You know, some commentators, they, they think about Samson. You know, earlier we said, it, the picture, we've probably seen clips or a picture, an image of Samson drawn or on a movie or a clip or whatever. You know, he's just popping out of his shirt. You know, he makes Hulk Hogan look small, right? You know, 
And uh, the Hulkmeister, or Master, I don't know, something. I used to watch wrestling back in the day. And, uh, you know, we just think he's just this big, muscle-strapped guy. And a lot of people that I've heard as I've researched this passage, and Samson even in the past, is that a lot of people think that Samson was of normal build. That he looks like me or you. That, that he just, he just a regular looking Joe, about 5'11 and a half, you know, 200 pounds, whatever, just, just a regular dude. And you say, well, what, how could that be? Because Samson's supernatural strength is what it is. It is supernatural. And it would not be giving God glory. You know, if, if, if you, if a, one of, you know, one of the strongest men in the world came in and, and picked up this communion table, you'd be like, what? Well, that's not God. That's his, that's his own body doing that. Now, if I picked it up, you'd be like, praise God, right? This is clearly a supernatural gifting of the spirit that's just flowing into Ben's body, right? You know, there's no way I could do that by myself. And so I think that's what is happening here that God is doing, is that God loves to use weak people to show off his strength. Have you noticed that? And he was ready to do that with Samson, but Samson was foolishly wasting his time. It says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 25 through 27. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Hear that. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And I think that's the case with Samson, right? I think that's why he didn't look like Hulk Hogan, right? I think that's why... Samson looked more like me, minus the bald spot, right? You know, I think he looked like this normal person because God loves doing this. But this, this Samson just wastes away opportunity after opportunity, year after year, moment after moment, because he is so focused on just kind of being blasé, flippant, casual, joking about sin instead of actively warning against sin. So I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I suppose somebody does because it's in our text. We got to start taking sin seriously. I, I, I describe sin to people all the time. Sometimes we think, oh, sin is sin is whatever. It's active treason against God. When you sin, consider this. God turned his back on his own son on the cross when Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. If, if the father would turn his back on his son who bore the world's sin, that should tell you something about your sin in relation to God, right? How how. Serious, how heinous of an action of, of sin is. It's treasonous to the kingdom of God. So fools will always fall for something sweet and something sinful. And fools will always make jokes about sin instead of warning against sin. But let's keep reading here. 16, 1 through 4. And then we'll come down a little bit. Samson went to Gaza. And there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. The Gazites were told Samson has come here. They surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he rose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and pulled them up bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. That's 40 miles from where Gaza's at, if you were wondering. Verse 4, after this he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, keep uh, going and reading uh, through 17, verse 7 through 19, Delilah and Samson, as you may or may not know, they do this dance of Delilah says, tell me the secret to your strength. He gives her a lie. She acts on that. T turns out it was a lie. They do this like three or four times. And then finally, Samson tells her the real secret. She really cuts off his hair, which is now the third violation of the Nazarite vow. It was no wine. It was don't touch dead bodies. And it was don't cut your hair. And Samson now has finally abolished all three. And so we see that it finally goes. He finally tells her the secret. And we read in verse 20 to 21 of chapter 16. She, Delilah, said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. The Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground the mill at the prison. Folks, that's what sin does when you stay contented in sin. 
verse 21 is an absolute crystal clear picture of what non-repentant, contented state of living in sin looks like. That's where it gets you. It, it makes you a spiritual prisoner in every kind of way, just like it did with Samson. Here's a third thing that's worth observing about fools is that fools keep taking foolish risks when they don't get caught. You ever done this? You ever, you ever played the role of the fool like Samson? That just because there wasn't, you know, we skipped over chapter 15. Listen, he keeps doing this, you know, all throughout Samson's life, he just keeps taking foolish risk after foolish risk and just keeps going down this. You can see, even when you read chapter 14, you know what's coming in chapter 16 because you know it's not going to turn out good. Because he's being what? He's being foolish. So you can see this coming down the pipe, but, but there's no immediate consequences for Samson. And then finally you read 1620, and you see, oh, well, now the, the Lord has left him. Now he doesn't have eyes. I mean, imagine that. You know, average Joe Smith, Samson, now doesn't have supernatural strength. The Lord is gone. His eyes are out. And he is an inmate for the rest of his life. Because I think he just kept thinking, I mean, he, I don't, I'm not even assuming. I'm not even theorizing. Look again at verse 20. She says, Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep. Look what he says. I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. <laughs> That's the worst thing you can do in life. Is say, I got enough willpower to overcome sin by myself. I got no, I, I'm just going to muster it. You ever tried to pull your up, yourself up by your bootstraps in life, spiritually? How's that going for you? I'm going to assume probably not great. You know, we, we have these rededication moments and we go, we say, Lord, going forward, I, I'm going to live for you the rest. And how are you doing three hours later? Probably not great. You can't do it by yourself. You see this with Samson in 1620. He, he foolishly thinks, I can, I can go to war. I can, I can keep at bay consequences, but I'm going to keep sin close. That's what the fool does. That's what the fool thinks. And over time, so you've probably experienced this, right? Over time, you keep dabbling in something sinful, something you know you should be abstaining from, you keep avoiding something you know you should be doing, eventually the consequence is going to happen, right? Eventually the inevitable is going to play out. Have you ever done something because you thought you were invincible? No one's going first today, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, you think about, have I done something because I thought I was invincible? And maybe we don't view ourselves as Samson or this, you know, uh, hero with superpowers or something, and, and maybe you, you are saying, of course I'm not invincible, of course not. But man, sometimes we make decisions that way, don't we? Sometimes we really are convinced, man, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure it doesn't come back on me. And this is what Samson does. It says this in Proverbs 18.6, A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. How's that for your new license plate? Get PRO186. New license plate sticker for you there. Samson just keeps doing the same thing over and over, and he thinks nothing's going to happen, right? The, to that point of that proverb, you just keep talking and talking. You can just keep talking smack, talking smack, talking smack. Maybe 10 people don't, don't give you a beating, but the 11th person, person does what? Gets in a scorpion death lock and says, let me, let me put into play Proverbs 18.6. I'm going to give you the beating that you've had coming for a long time. Samson just keeps having close call after close call. You know what I wonder? Look at 16, 1 through 3, with the, this, this incident with the prostitute. You know, he, he, he just doing his womanizing thing and just going around, just sleeping with whoever will sleep with him and just, just going throughout life, just totally blowing his whole life. And it says there in verse... Uh, in verse 2, I believe it is. Uh, well, so they set the ambush and they say, let's wait till morning and, and then we will kill him. And then verse 3, Samson lay till midnight and at midnight he arose, you know, takes the gate. What, what made Samson rise up in the middle of the night? You wonder this? You know, I mean, there's a couple thoughts here, you know. Uh, 
Was it his conscience eating away at him at midnight, couldn't sleep? Finally, it's starting to catch up to him. It, is it something the prostitute said? Maybe she tipped her hand to him? Because more than likely, all the prostitutes everywhere in the land of Philistia are instructed to say, hey, when Samson comes calling, because he will, not if, but he will, when he does, dial it in. That's why they were able to set the ambush up so quickly, right? Or maybe it's a noise he heard outside. I, I don't know what, what made him rise up. But we have got to learn from Samson's life here this important thing to apply to our life. And that is that Samson just kept doing the same thing over and over again and thought that it would not catch up to him and just kept making foolish risk after foolish risk. And so think about that applicably for your life today. Think have I been doing things lately that have been foolishly risking my health? Have I, in the last few months, been doing things that have been foolishly, I've been foolishly risking my reputation? In the last year, have I done practices and things or not done things at work, at my job, that is foolishly risking my job security? Have I been doing things in the last decade in relation to my marriage that is foolishly risking the state and the faithful covenant of my marriage with my spouse? Because it's easy to look at Samson and say, what a dingbat, right? What an idiot. The writing's on the wall. Everyone sees what's coming down the pipe. But, but man, me and you, we've played the fool before, right? We've, have you ever made the same mistake Again and again and again. Has anyone done the same sin more than 33 times? Yeah, that's all of us, right? We, we don't need to be lectured on that at all. It says this in Proverbs 6, 27 through 28. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? You know that saying there? It's a rhetorical question, by the way, if you didn't get that. What's the answer? No, no, you can't. You can't play with fire and not get burned. Fire is always going to burn. So Samson just got all these women just passing, passing through his life, just playing with fire over and over and over and over again, thinking, well, I got these flame retardant gloves on. <laughs> you know, I, I got my fireman jacket on. I got, I, I, I've been able to, to keep it at bay for a while. And he just thinks, I can just go forever. I can just keep doing this over and over again and not have any consequences. I really think what Samson is saying in Judges 16, 20 is, I'm able to manage my sin. Is that something you're currently doing? Is uh, you know what you're doing is not right? You know that what you're not doing, you need to start doing. So it's either commission or omission sins. And uh, you just say, man, I, I got it managed. I got it, under, I got it under control. It says this in Romans 7, 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. If that's not the most relatable verse in the Bible, I don't know what is. That's Paul the Apostle talking. A guy that wrote one-fourth of the Bible through the insp inspiration of the Spirit. He says, man, uh, what, I, what I know I should be doing, I don't do. And what I know I shouldn't be doing, I just keep on doing it. And the church said, amen. That's, we reluctantly confirm that, but, but it's sad but true at the same time. You know, this point about fools keep taking foolish risks when they don't get caught. Not getting caught is actually worse for you. You know why? We think not getting caught is great. But, but not getting caught is actually worse because it assures that you will indulge in it again. And then the consequences will probably be even more elevated, right? Trying to be sneaky and cover it up and keep the consequences at bay... It's going to nail you eventually. I just got a couple questions I want to run through with you real quick on how to avoid foolish risk. 
you say, I, I get what you're saying. I'm with you. I'm, I'm tracking with you today. How do, how do we avoid falling into this trap of, of Samson? How do we avoid taking foolish risks? Here's a couple questions to think about. Are the rewards worth as much as the consequences will cost with whatever you're dabbling in? Another question, have I fully researched the risk? Another question, what has happened to others who've taken the same risk? What is my motivation for taking this risk? What will my life be like if I don't take this risk? What does the Bible say about the risk I'm considering? You know what's sad at this point? You get to Judges 16, and there is no difference between Samson the Israelite and the Philistine people. Israel is supposed to be holy, set apart, different than all the other nations in the world. And, and when you look at Samson's life and the Philistine people, they're, they're not a shred of difference between them. They are the same person. We see God's long suffering in this story. Let's close out by reading chapter 16, verses 28 through 30. It says this. Samson has been brought in to entertain. You see there in verse 27, 3,000 men and women were on top of uh, the temple that we're looking at on why Samson entertained them as a prisoner of war. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines from my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. He leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his whole life. Here's a big idea today that I want you to leave with. <laughs> is that it's never too late to start making wise choices. I really think one of Satan's tactics is to say, you've been a fool once, you've been a fool twice, you've been a fool a 98th time, you might as well just stay a fool because you've been a fool your whole life. Have you noticed it's easier to stay and keep doing the same thing than it is to change? Do you notice that in life? And we got to get this, that it's never too late. Look at verse 22, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. We see God's long suffering, his grace, saying, man, I'm giving all of us full second, third, fourth, fifth chances. And Samson cries out, man, there's no need for us to bring all of you guys up on stage and everyone give a testimony of how they've been foolish because we all relate with Samson. There's not one person in this room that says, I've never played the fool before. I want to come back, look at this in Judges 14, 4. In relation to Samson picking out his wife that was a Philistine, it says this, his father and mother didn't know that it was from the Lord. He was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. The Lord, he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. This is, this is a great thing about God. What it's saying there is that even though Samson's doing the wrong thing, even though he has sinful motives, even though he's intermarrying like he shouldn't be, even though he's, he's making this wrong choice, this sinful choice, even though he has this lifestyle of sin, God is still going to work his plan out through foolish people. Somebody say, that's good news today. <laughs> that's got to be welcome news because we mess it up a lot. We screw it up a lot for God, and God is never surprised, and he knew exactly what Samson's going to do philandering with women his whole life, just womanizing all throughout his life, being this playboy, just running around, just not doing anything for the kingdom of God. And God says, actually, I I'm going to use what I know Samson will do for my own benefit. And so Samson killed the 30 Philistines in chapter 14. He kills a slew of them in verses 7 through 8. In chapter 15, he kills a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone, all because of this revenge game that he keeps doing. And then finally, he kills over 3,000 people, Philistine people, and, and liberates God's people from bondage because of this. It says this in Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. You got to hear that today because some of you are convinced my beginning has been so bad. My life has been so bad. I talked to this friend in high school. I invited him to church. He's, he, he said jokingly, but I think he was serious. He said, God, God's not going to forgive me at this point in my life. He's a high schooler saying that. The end is better than the beginning. So if you've been playing the fool, you need to realize 
God is long-suffering in his grace. He's wanting to give you another chance in Jesus to make the end good for you. Let me close out by saying this. If, if you could deal with the sin problem yourself, there'd be no need for Jesus. And maybe there's some of you sitting here today saying, I don't have need for Jesus. I'm self-made. I, I take care of myself, provide for myself, live my own life, do my own thing. Look where it got Samson in Judges 16.20. Got him marred, imprisoned, hopeless, defeated, sorry for the rest of his life on earth. So make a wise choice. It's really interesting, the, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 11.32 uh, you know, talking about the hall of faith, these different characters that did different things by faith, mentions Samson in there with David, the prophet, Samuel, all these different people. It's like, Samson? I mean, I've just made the case for 30, 40 minutes why Samson is probably one of the most faithless people in the Bible. And he sneaks in Samson's name in there. What is that about? Because in verses 28 through 30 in Judges 16, even though it's for the wrong motive, even, it's, even though it's for revenge, Samson has faith to call out to God and he expects God to hear when he cries out to him. And that's good news for me and you because that's exactly true with Jesus. Is that however big of a mess you've made of your life, however what all the consequences maybe are, have fallen on your head now that you've been trying to escape, whatever your life looks like, the good news of the gospel is that when you cry out to Jesus, he answers you. And that is the truth of the Bible. That is the truth of the gospel. Man, so if there's anyone in our presence today that, that says, I've been a fool during my life. I've foolishly been dabbling in sin and it's catching up to me. Or maybe it's close to catching up. Or maybe it's all falling on my head and I don't know where to go. Let me point you to this guy called Jesus. Who is ready to say, doesn't matter how many foolish mistakes you made. Doesn't matter how much sin you've been dabbling in. I'm ready to take it all on me, Jesus, and give you my righteousness. Man, if you need to act on that today, I invite you to come forward and talk to me as we stand and sing. Will you pray with me as we close? Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this tragic story of Samson. It really is tragic, but it's so helpful for our teaching today. It's so helpful for building us up in, in righteousness of helping us not make these foolish risks that Samson took. You know, the details look different. Maybe it's not Samson's temptation for us. Maybe it is. But none the same. Satan always puts something sweet and something sinful. And the natural temptation for us is to push away consequences, but still invite sin in. So, Lord, I pray that we would all get serious today as followers of Jesus about sin. If you, the Father, would turn your back on your own son, Jesus... Because he who knew no sin became sin. We need to understand sin is a big deal. But praise be to Jesus. Who gives us eternal life. Takes on our sin for himself. And invites us to live a new life of righteousness for the kingdom of God. Lord if there is anyone in the room that says. Man I've been foolish. I've been living in sin. Let them come forward today and be liberated only because of what Jesus has done. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so to me. Oh, the old
chased us down, you knocked down those mountains that we couldn't climb. You carry us, Lord, and protect us under the shadow of your wings. Thank you. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And may all said, Amen. Amen. All right. For our send out today, let's go ahead and sing that chorus of God of Wonders, and then you'll be dismissed. God of Wonders, God of Galaxy. Galaxy. 